Today we're doing a Parsha Vayashev. And before we get into it, what I've started in these Parsha discussions is a little bit of meditation, just five minute meditation to get us into the right understanding, okay? And not everybody knows how to meditate. In fact, somebody today asked me, like, can you teach us how to meditate? So I'm going to take a minute here to go over it. First thing, sit quietly. That's pretty easy. Watch, but don't get involved with your thoughts. Don't try to suppress your thoughts. Uh, don't fight your thoughts. Just watch them go by like you're a stream with you're sitting in the bank, things are going by, okay? And the next is, particularly with this kind of meditation, there's, uh, there may be an energetic flow. In this context, this is uh, the <clears throat> Ruach Kadesh energy that we're talking about, very traditional uh, Torah understanding, which most people don't know it's part of the Torah as intensely. Then, we want to focus our mind. So what do we do with that? We call it a mantra, a focus point. And in 1995, I was given this after the 21st day of a water fast. And here's what I was given. And it's yod on the in-breath, hey on the out-breath. Wa on the in-breath, Hey, I'm now good. Yod from the base up to the heart, and then hey out to the heart. Uh, wa from the base up to what we call third eye, or dot, D A A T, and then hey back out to the heart. And you simply keep repeating that until your mind is quiet. That's it. That's a super simple. But it helps focus your mind, and then you let go of this name, this name of God is grace, and let grace take its place. And then the final part, which again is very uh, Torah traditional, is the haniha, the transmission of energy. And we do that by just letting the energy come through. I have been empowered to do this. Uh, to help awaken that Ruha Kadesh energy. That's really uh, a bigger mission for me. And that I've been inside, literally. So, we, uh, you simply look at me, see the energy coming through, and as it comes through, it can awaken the Ruha Kadesh. It also tends to burn karma, as the Baal Shem Tov said in talking about this, a little bit of my soul goes into you, and that's part of the story. Uh, and I also take on some of the karma to burn it off. Just part of what happens. The good news is God kind of burns up everything off me, so I don't really have to worry about it, which I like. I appreciate that. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is just focus on me. We're just going to go five minutes here and focus and here we go. Meditation, just repeat this name of God as grace. Yod and in breath. Hey and out breath. Wah and in breath. Hey and out breath. And we just do it for five minutes. We're just kind of learning and practicing.
come out of meditation. And now we're going to discuss the Parsha, Parashya. This is an amazing Parsha. One of the things that makes it so amazing is that it has to do really with our everyday life situation. What do I mean by that? We have Jacob. He thinks he's done. He faced Laban and he faced his brother and he <clears throat> did all kinds of things. And now he's finally made it back into uh, Am Israel and it's time to retire. I've done my job. The only problem is God didn't see it that way. Hashem didn't see it that way. So a major thing happens. So let me give you the context of the story uh, so we can kind of understand it. Uh, Jacob's favorite son is Yosef. And he does a lot of things to favor Yosef, including the co coat of many colors, a special tunic that he wears, but it made his brothers jealous. And that jealousy is dangerous. First it was hateful, but then jealous. And that's where we have trouble in our world when people, because it empowers our negative thinking with some level of illogical justification, which is exactly what happened for the brothers. What makes it worse? Joseph has two prophetic dreams. Now he and his father Jacob both have prophetic dreams, and we'll get into that in a moment, but he has two prophetic dreams. One is they're gathering sheaves uh, of wheat in the field, and his sheaf, Joseph's sheaf, stands straight, and the sheaves of the brothers bow to him. Now that certainly pushes his brother's buttons without a doubt, without a question. Next, he has a dream that the sun and the moon and 11 stars bow to him. So he's saying, all of I'm Israel will bow to me. So, and his brothers were very upset with it. Even Jacob had to pretend as if he was upset, but Jacob knows about dreams. He knows about the power of prophecy. So we're going to talk about that for a moment before we play it out, because this is all part of the, a big part of the story. And we're, let's start with Jacob. Jacob has an incredible dream experience. We call it Jacob's Ladder. Uh, the angels ascending and descending. Very powerful. When he awakes, he says, this is the place of God. Not was the place of God, very important. Because when he says it is, he's saying my dream reality and my actual everyday life reality is the same. Well, that's heavy, okay? And he comes out of that sleep and he had 12 rocks around him, becomes one rock and it becomes, uh, and he uh, anoints that one rock. And in that way he's activating his dream, bringing it from the dream into physical reality. And right after that, he then lifts his feet and goes to complete his mission. So the message here is our dreams, our visions, same type of thing, that we're given that are truly clear, are what is going to happen. And Jacob knows that. And Yosef knows it. And his brothers didn't exactly want to know it. But when he shared the second dream, Jacob clearly got this is for this is this is what's going to happen. So because they were both dream masters. So the power of of, of prophecy, the power of vision. Later we have Tamar. It was Tamar. Tamar is, is the 
daughter of Shem, also known as Melchizedek, the granddaughter of Noah. And she has a vision that she is going to, uh, from her womb, will come forth the messianic energies and the divinic uh, kingdom, the d divinic messianic energies. She's willing to do anything to make that happen because she knows in her heart that's truth. That's truth. And she knows she needs to marry Judah or Judah's family, but the Judah's sons don't respond to her in the right way and they both, they, two of them die and Judah is uh, afraid to give his third son. And the reasons why they die, which wasn't her fault, uh, except for her beauty, and so, uh, which is not her fault. And then she hears that Judah is coming near the town of Timnah, and he's doing sheep and, and, and getting together with his buddies to do some kind of sheep shearing type thing. He's on his way, and she says, okay. I'm just going to have to make it this way. So she gets out of her uh, widow's clothing because when you really have a dream prophecy, you got to play it out. And she really gets it. You got to play it out. So she dresses up as a harlot um, uh, on the road that he's going to be walking on. Now he's not thinking about sex. He's thinking about sheep and shearing sheep. He's just a simple guy, kind of, it's not simple, but he's, he's walking down the road to meet his buddies to, whatever they do with sheep shearing. I don't know, I've never sheared a sheep. Um, and I'm not from New Zealand, okay? So why well, they do a lot of sheep shearing? Okay, just joking. The point I'm making here is he's innocent and he's passing by this, quote, harlot. And he's, he's kind of passing by her, but then there's an intervention. God sends an angel to point him towards having sex with the harlot and kind of activating the lust sexual energy, but more than that, kind of a message that great things will come from this. It's kind of subtle, but not that subtle. God has intervened and gets him to get together with Tamar, and indeed they do get together, and it's a whole story of she makes sure she has identifications from him. So she knows in the, in a few months down the line, three months down the line, she's gonna to have to pull that identification out to say, hey, it was you and I was that harlot. That is not who I am, but that's what I had to do because you weren't doing your job. You weren't giving me your third son. You weren't participating in this lineage energy that had to happen. And my vision is, it has to happen. So I'm doing whatever I can, even if it may cost me my life. So, three months later, uh, she's brought in with a death sentence because she's pregnant and she's single and she's the daughter of a high, of a high priest. So, lots of things are going on. And, she, and, and it's said is that Satan hid the, the staff, the signet ring, and his cloak that he had given it, and she, she was about ready to be executed, and finally, she remembers where it is. God was playing with her a little bit, and she shows it to Judah, and he obviously understands it's him. And he says, uh, you're more righteous than I. So her life is saved. He, it, really the first public omission in the Torah of, of uh, let's say, uh, mistake, so to speak. Of course, it's not a mistake. It's the divine plan. And if people aren't quite ready for it, they're going to be pushed a little bit to fulfill it. That's what happened. So I will give you an idea a little bit how it works. But when you really get it, that you have visions of what you're supposed to do as part of the divine process in the world. She's playing, she played it out fearlessly. At, at, as I say, a point of potential high risk. Now, now we go back. 
So Jacob and Yosef also know there's a vision because the truth is Jacob wasn't done. There had to be one more uh, process here, which is going down into Egypt. And Yosef had to be the vehicle for that. So uh, they both kind of know it because remember, these people are very intuitive, are, are very prophetic. And so uh, Jacob takes Yosef up to, and he's 17 years old, up to the cave of Machpelah, uh, the, uh, where Abraham and Yitzhak, Abraham and Sarah and Yitzhak and Rebecca are buried. And they ask for the blessings. And he's particularly asking for the blessing that he will survive uh, his encounter with his brothers. Now, four generations later, Caleb does the same thing. He goes to the cave of Mechpelah. He's with the ten spies. And he asks, again, for a blessing because he knows what he's going to see and share will put him at risk with the spies. Four generations later, this is the beginning of going down, because we have to understand that the part that Jacob didn't do, wasn't quite ready to do, he's obviously doing it, was the next step of going down into Egypt and the exodus and return to the land. Okay? So, yeah, uh, Yosef is starting that with the blessing, and Caleb is finishing it with the blessing of the, uh, of the uh, others, elders. Okay, so he's blessed, he goes down, his father walks into a certain way uh, in, into, uh, towards where they are, and uh, then Yosef is looking and he can't find him. They're supposed to be in Shechem, they can't find him. So he sees a man walking in the field. That man is the angel Gabriel. So twice now, we have angels intervening to make it happen. And in fact, in this particular thing, there's a, a lot of symbolism that suggests the Shekinah energy is actually very much involved in it. So angel Gabriel tells them, yeah, well, they're up in uh, no time, and, and that's where you go. So he goes, the brothers see him, and all their jealousy is like, hey, we got it we can kill him. And then the brothers do their debating and this and that, and they ultimately make a long story short, they don't kill him, and they sell him off as a slave to the Ishmaelites, and then he gets sold to the Medianites, and it goes back and forth. Eventually, he's sold into slavery uh, in, in Egypt, which is a, a hard way to make the transition. But that's what happens, okay? Now, what's going on here is another piece. And this is why Yosef is so amazing. He's at peace with the whole thing. How come? Well, that's why we practice meditating. Because he knows the inner truth, and he's a true Zodic already, although he's only 17, in the sense that he's at peace um, with inner peace. And the and the point I want to make when I back up about Jacob is that is the way. You're never done. It never completes itself. So uh, Abram has his ten trials, and Yitzhak has his issues with his, with his uh, brother, okay? And then Jacob has his trials and tribulations with his brother, and Laban, and it goes on and on. We're never done. There's always some trial. There's always some tribulation that happens. This is part of the spiritual path. It's actually one of the beauties of the spiritual path. When you know you're never done, bad things don't happen. Everything that comes to you is an opportunity to grow spiritually. Now I talk about that in, in my book, Into the Nothing, is that take every experience as an opportunity to grow spiritually. So this is the principle here that's going on. And uh, Jakob and Yosef are, are really using that, but the principle is being introduced. And so things happen, that's just the way it is when you're on the spiritual path, uh, and we have to be at peace with that, which is the key, is the, the inner peace in the midst of the outer turmoil. The inner peace in the midst of the outer turmoil. 
That's a very, very important lesson. And just because you're at a high space, don't even dare assume everything's going to be easy sailing. That isn't the way it works. Because the forces of God keep wanting us to ascend higher and higher. And to do that, we are tried and tested uh, continually. And uh, that makes it very beautiful. Because once you get it, it never stops. Then you're prepared that it never stops. And you're, at least for me, I'm looking forward to the next challenge. And, and I'm going to say something else. The visions that come, and for me, and I think for many people, we have life visions. I mean, at four years old, I know I want to be a doctor. And I go on and on as I write in my book, Into Nothing. The key is follow your vision. Follow your vision. If you have a, a, a vision that's happening, don't toss it away. Don't disregard it. Be willing to follow it, no matter how difficult it may be. Because sometimes it's really difficult. Sometimes it puts you through major tests, okay, that you didn't plan on, but it, the spiritual path requires following our vision. So now we have that, they sell them into slavery, and then uh, they come back and they tell Yakov he was killed, and Yakov goes into depression. Now what about depression? Depression separates you from God. And he gets stuck there for 22 years. Now, grief is not the same thing. You have a loss, uh, somewhere between three months, nine months, people heal from that grief. Depression is something that goes beyond that, and that separates you from the divine. And so, Jacob, because he wasn't really understanding the, that we're always being tested, like Abraham did, Yitzhak did. For some reason, Jacob didn't quite get it yet. He does get it at the end, and he does have 17 years of bliss, but he does didn't quite get it at that time. So he's in depression uh, for the next 22 years. So that's the play there. Now, we also have the play with, again, Tamar. And I think the key, as I explained with Tamar, she knew she's following her vision again. She knew that she had to do this. It doesn't matter what. That's one of the hard things about a vision. Is you got to follow. If you're evolved spiritually, you got to follow it. You have to take it to wherever it goes, however inconvenient it is. However, people around you think you're, you know, not really understanding things or you're off. <sighs> Problem with, with prophetic visions that you got to follow. And obviously, Jacob's, uh, Joseph's brothers thought he was nuts. Like, yeah, you're going to reign over us. Try this. We're going to put you in the pit. Now we're going to sell you into slavery. Now, let's see how you're going to reign over us. So when you do have visions, particularly of a higher order, there's always Yosef's brothers hanging around to create doubt, to undermine, and maybe really actively undermine. So that does happen. That's just part of the game. So now we're we're seeing kind of the the bigger picture of this. So what are we saying? We're saying, in summary, the spiritual path never lets up. So don't even think about it. Be open to all that keeps coming your way, because that's the way it is. Keep that inner peace. That's why we meditate, so we're being in the place of inner peace. And also we have the knowledge that that is uh, the way it is in terms of the spiritual evolution. We're always being tested. Be willing to take risks. Like Yosef knew, as did Jacob, that even though he needed to go this way to go down into Egypt, he knew he could also get killed, which almost happened. And then we have uh, Judah and Tamar, same thing, taking risks. So that's part of it. 
Follow your dream. Follow your dream vision. It's a secret to reaching your highest potential in your life. Even if it's a bumpy road, even if it seems impossible, we don't get dream visions if it's impossible, okay? Follow your dream vision. And most important, it all works if we keep focusing on the light of God within ourselves, the power of Shim within us, and being willing to be open to the power of Shim outside. There's another little piece here, and that's twice here, God intervenes. Once with Angel Gabriel telling uh, Yosef to go this way to find his brothers, and the angel that appears and convinces uh, Judah that he needs to have sexual relations with Tamar. It's like, again, here's this guy. He's just like going to a sheep shearing thing with his buddies. What's the big deal? And suddenly this angel appears as a, as a regular person and says, no, go this way here for the moment. This is what's supposed to happen. Uh, and appealing to uh, energies of lust and, and also mission. So, God is playing. God is making it happen, even if we're a little slow to get it. Trust your vision. Trust the play of God in your life. Keep connected to the divine within yourself as well as without. This is uh, such a beautiful aparsha for these lessons. Shalom, shalom, shalom.